Hi, this is Robert Furrow, and welcome to the TruthQuest podcast. This is TruthQuest Q&A, where we look at questions through the lens of Scripture. Our desire is to know what the Bible says so that we can determine what we believe and to evaluate what we've been taught by the things the Scripture says so that we can know the truth. Jesus said in Matthew 24 about the last days, and I think we're living in them, take heed to yourselves that you are not deceived. The best way to make sure that we are not deceived is to use the Word of God as the way that we examine what we believe. And the Word of God, it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, is profitable for reproof, for correction, for doctrine, that the man of God would be thoroughly equipped, lacking in nothing. So it's desire, it's our desire to study God's Word that we might show ourselves approved to God by rightly dividing the Word of God. It's good to see you guys. Uh, this is a Q&A. If you have any questions, you can submit them to the comment section below. Uh, write the word question in front of it, then write out your question. After you write it for a couple of times, uh, then go ahead and uh, recheck it. Make sure that it makes sense, and then go ahead and submit it. We are also going to be taking just one question from each person, so write out your question carefully. And uh, it's good to see you guys. I'm going to go ahead and get into our first question, which is, what is Christian apologetics and should we study it more? Thank you for your question. Uh, so Christian apologetics comes from the word um, apology, which is not to apologize, but it means to defend, to give a defense for the faith that you have. And so apologists defend the faith against atheists, against um, full, uh, world humanism, against materialists, and each Christian should be able to give a defense for what they believe. Probably the main verse that backs up uh, apologists or that apologists use comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the screen here. Um, uh, uh, verse 15. It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in you. And then it says, with meekness and fear. I love verse 16 too, having a good conscience that when they defame you as an evildoer, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. So there's two parts to apologetics in our life. Number one, is being able to defend the faith. That's being able to answer probably what are the most common questions that are out there. And there's probably a total of 15 of them. Things like, if God is good, how can there be suffering and evil in the world? That's one that every Christian should, should really be able to search the scriptures to figure out how they answer it. Um, is morality subjective or objective? These are things that, that materialists, humanists, atheists argue about. Um, being aware of apologetics, maybe reading some apologetics books, can really help you to be able to defend your position and perhaps even to win some win someone over to Christ when they have a genuine question. I found out for so many, there's not really a genuine question, but we run into them and they're ready to receive Christ, but they've got genuine questions and when you've got the answers to them, it can be extremely powerful. So I suggest um, if you're new to apologetics, then A Case for Faith by Lee Strobel, A Case for Christ, uh, maybe even A Case for Creation. You can get those in audiobooks, so you can listen to them while you're driving, or you can get them in books if you're a reader, and you can sit down and read them, but they are very, very helpful. And um, from there, there's a lot of good apologetic books that are out there, and um, I can give you a list for those of you who want them who are more advanced. All right? So thank you very much uh, for your question. Let's go ahead and get back here. We'll take this out and we'll go ahead and look at the questions that you guys are providing. Again, it's good to see you. Uh, we are taking questions and looking at them through the lens of scripture. We're taking one question per person. If we get more, if we don't have enough to cover the full hour, we'll scan back and pick up some of the other questions. But in order to really make sure uh, that we can answer the questions for those of you that are popping on and beginning to watch this, um, then uh, you can fill out uh, the, a comment in the comment section, put a question mark in front of it or quest the word question, write it out, reread it a couple of times, and then go ahead and submit it. And we'll take a look at it on the podcast. All right. 
Um, question, Psych Man says, Robert, can we pray for something for you that's God's will? Excludes personal lust as James mentions, not to big something specific we can believe God will grant and thank um, and thank him when he does. Um, yeah, I mean, you can pray for, you pray for my family, pray for, uh, yeah, pray for my family. Pray that God would work within my entire family. That'd be great. Thank you very much, Psych Man. I really appreciate your prayers. All right. Um, and uh, let's see. We have a question here from Joe, and Joe has a follow-up question. Um, question, follow-up, just to be clear regarding mediums, there is no such thing as a Christian medium then. I just want to clarify about those who say they are Christians and are able to speak and hear what uh, hear from the dead is all. Thank you. All right, Joe, and so I did read your comment before. Um, the last time I responded to this and just kind of made it really clear that <clears throat> to contact the dead, to be a medium, to be a psychic, is against what the Bible says. You're seeking, you're seeking direction from a person who claims that they can speak to the dead, and so many of them are charlatans, so many of them are just liars. They're fakes. Um, and if they are able to do it, they do it by demonic powers. So yes, I would say if a Christian, if a psychic becomes a Christian, so that could happen. So a psychic meets Christ, has an encounter, meets Christ and invites him in. The Holy Spirit would convict him of what he needs to change. He would read the scriptures and find the truth within the word of God. If not, it would become evident that he doesn't have a relationship with Christ because he would continue on. When we think of this topic, I think of Acts chapter 8 where there's a, there's a warlock, a sorcerer, and he wants to buy the Holy Spirit so that he can have the power of the Holy Spirit and Paul rebukes him. So to be really clear, Joe, uh, if someone says, I'm a psychic and I'm a Christian, the two don't go hand in hand. Unless they're a really new Christian and God's beginning to reveal to them the changes that are made. But for them to say, God's given me a gift and I'm a born again believer and I'm on my way to heaven, they are deceived. It is, it is being deceived. All right? So there is no way that you can, and, and as Christians, we need to stay as far away from this stuff as we can because God is the one who tells us our future. God is the one who tells the future. God is the one who speaks to the dead. God is the only one who can genuinely speak to the dead. All right, Joe? So hopefully that is, um, that kind of clears that up. All right, so thank you very much. Um, I don't know how I can be any clearer with this. Uh, if someone is claiming to be a psychic, and claiming to be a Christian, then something doesn't jive. One of those has got to go. It's either going to be their Christianity, or it's going to be they're no longer a psychic and they're not a medium. And that's what I hope for, for whoever, whatever individual you're talking about who is claiming that they're able to be a psychic. You just, you just cannot do it, okay? It's something demonic. And um, we as Christians should look to God for our future and put our trust in Him, not in horoscopes or psychics or any of these other things that the world does. Okay? Thank you very much, Joe. I appreciate that. I appreciate you and um, your persistence to get the, the right answer to it. Sorry, Joe, if I was a little bit short with you a couple of, um, a couple of, of uh, Q and A's ago. Um, my desire is just to make it really clear that you cannot be a psychic and say that you are a born again Christian. That might be able to happen for a short time, but you're gonna let that go as soon as the Holy Spirit begins to convince you. All right, so Renee, we have a question from her. She comes to us from Facebook. Um, she says, question, my brother-in-law is still mourning his wife, my sister. I know each one of us mourn differently and for the different, for the different lengths of time. What scripture can I give him this time both my brother-in-law and sister-in-law are Christians. I miss her too. Thank you, Pastor Robert. Um, so, Renee, I'm sorry to hear about your um, your sister, right? Uh, both my brother, yeah, your sister. I'm sorry to hear about that. Uh, it, it is a tragedy. And you may know that I lost my wife in 2012. Um, and 
entered into what to me was a, a year and a half of just darkness and difficulty. Even though, hey, even though I was surrounded by friends and family that loved the Lord and were there for me and there to help me, you just go through grief and different, different processes. And the biggest key is to be there with them, to do things for them, to help them, to, to come alongside of them. Be careful that you don't say trite things, and I know you wouldn't, you're too close to this, it's your sister. But sometimes as Christians, we end up saying things that are trite and they are not effective. I, the things that people told me after the death of Lisa, um, I just can't believe that they did, that they said it. I found myself finally just going, okay, thanks. And then moving on quickly. And um, your brother-in-law has to go through grief. There's no way around it. The only way to get out of the other side healthy is to go through it. And it really is a, it's a little bit of a dangerous time because grief can, you can be looking for ways to, to have that grief um, not feel so bad. For example, people often get married quickly after someone's died because that sense of romance is strong. You meet somebody new and that's strong. It, it doesn't last forever, it's there for a while, and um, it can damper the grieving process. So sometimes people get married way too soon after grieving, and m my advice to him would just be take your time. Grief works different for everybody. I dealt with anger. I dealt with anger towards God. I dealt with anger towards my wife. I dealt with anger. Uh, I dealt with, with, gre um, um, uh, with um, remorse, thinking that I had done something wrong. Uh, so all of those are just natural kind of things, and I hate, I hate to continue to refer back to, especially with something like this, but we have a full-length teaching on how to help someone who is grieving. So if you go to YouTube and just uh, type in um, how to help someone who's grieving, there's, there's a short video, how to help someone who's grieving, how to survive grieving, and then there's a longer teaching, how to help someone who's grieving, and we go over scriptures and ways to help them. And um, I believe it's extremely helpful. All right, so maybe um, Daniel could find that and put the link uh, in the comment section for you before we go off the air, Renee. But I think it will be helpful. Of course, you're going through the grieving process as well. And um, hopefully you're surrounded by friends and family that can help you through that process. All right, Renee, so sorry to hear that you lost your sister. All right. Um, and um, just be there for your brother-in-law. I think it will be helpful. All right. So, um, we have a question from Golden Truth. Golden Truth says, question, uh, Paz Robert. Um, I see a lot of controversy between post, pre-post trib. Can you please give a brief description of each and please give scriptures to support pre-tribulation rapture? Thank you. Um, Golden Truth, yes, thank you. Um, so, by far, the, sorry, by far, hold on, let me before I get into this. By far, in ev the evangelical world, the pre-tribulation rapture is the most popular. If you talk about teachers that God's using, Charles Swindoll, John MacArthur, um, Charles Stanley, David Jeremiah, um, Alistair Begg, uh, Greg Laurie. If you just go down the list, they all believe in the pre-trib rapture. And I think that's the, tr that's the truth for those te gifts, those teachers that God has given as gifts to the church. The minority view is the post-tribulation rapture or the, or the mid-tribulation rapture or the pre-trib rapture or it'll all pan out in the end rapture. Those are all minority positions. Just because something's minority doesn't make it wrong. I'm not saying that to defend that. I'm just saying that oftentimes those who are post-trib or mid-trib will attack. Uh, why? I don't know. Those who are pre-trib don't have that same disposition. They'll accept someone who is post-trib or mid-trib or pre-wrath, your brothers and sisters in Christ. This isn't a main issue for the gospel and we will accept them as brothers and sisters. But oftentimes when people leave me messages being pre-trib, I'm gonna steal this from Charles Swindoll, I'm so pre-trib I don't eat post toasties that um, they you're a heretic, you're leading people astray, 
you're teaching them that they aren't supposed to have trouble and then all of a sudden they're gonna have it and they're gonna leave. Um, you're gonna be judged by God. So they just call me a non-believer because of my post-trip position. Doesn't matter what I believe about Jesus Christ or being born again or being filled with the Spirit or the resurrection or the Word of God. What matters to them is that I teach that Jesus is coming back three and a half or seven years later than what they believe. All right? So the pre-trib rap, there, there's a tribulation. This time is worse than anything that's ever going to come upon the earth. There are 21 judgments. Uh, seven of them are seals. The Antichrist comes on the scene. Then there's war. Then there's inflation. Then the trumpets begin to blast. And um, there's all kinds of things that happen before that. I think still in the seals is the, the, earth, the, the earth being scorched, the water being contaminated, meteors that hit the earth, 75-pound hailstones, creatures that... Um, they have a tail like a scorpion that attack and sting men and men want to die and can't. Um, uh, the bowl judgments, which could get worse as time goes on. So seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, 21 judgments total. And this is a horrible time where flesh becomes rare upon the earth. Some believe that Christians are going to go through it and have to suffer all of those things. But God's not mad at the church. And the tribulation period is called the time of God's indignation and a time of God's wrath. So it's God's wrath. I'm not saying we as Christians won't have troubles or difficulties or hard times because we will. In this world, we're going to be persecuted. We're going to have trouble, but not from God. God's not mad at his church. God loves his church. And so God has promised that he would come and take us back before. John 14, 1. Um, I'm going away. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where you are there, I will be also. So he comes and gets us. 1 Corinthians 15, the old. I tell you a mystery. So this rapture is a mystery. No wonder so many have such difficulty understanding it. We're not all going to die, but some of us are going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says that the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and we will forever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Revelation 3, 10 says that uh, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of testing that's to come upon the whole earth. Jesus said in Luke 21 that um, the we should be counted, that we should pray, that we would be counted worthy to escape all of these things. That's the context of the tribulation period, to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. Why would Jesus tell us to escape if we can't escape? Uh, I think that the post-trip position, you, you just wouldn't survive. The churches couldn't survive. The, Bible, the Revelation says the Antichrist has complete and total authority over the elect, meaning the, the Israel. Jeremiah 37 says it's a time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. It's a time of Israel's trouble. God's going to fulfill all of his prophecies about restoring the nation of Israel, which started in 1948, and he's going to restore the people of Israel during the tribulation period. Um, when the, the, um, the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Jesus said that the time of the Gentiles would be fulfilled when Jerusalem was no longer trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. And I think we're seeing that. Jews are going up on the Temple Mount for the first time in 2,000 years since it was destroyed in 70 AD to pray on the Temple Mount. Um, Jesus said, be ready. For the Son of Man comes is revealed at a time that you don't that that you don't expect. The Bible tells us he comes like a thief in the night, and he, but he doesn't come like a thief in the night to us Christians. It says the First Thessalonians chapter five, because we're aware we're waiting for him. Uh, it says in Luke seventeen that it's like the days of Noah. The, when, well, the Son of Man coming will be like the days of Noah. Men were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. And then Noah went into the ark. The door was shut by God. The ark was lifted up and destruction came. Um, if it's the end of the tribulation period, then people are not going to be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Life is not going to be going on like normal. It goes on to say in that same passage that it's like the days of Lot. A comparison between the days of the Son of Man and the days of Lot is that they were buying and selling and just going through their lives. And then Lot was taken out of the city and sudden destruction came upon them. On the, it was on the day that Lot was taken out, on the day that Lot went, that Noah went into the ark. Was it in the middle of the flood or the middle of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? It wasn't at the end. It was in the beginning. So there are so many more evidences, which is why the majority of Bible teachers in evangel in, in, who are premillennium, 
which is most of evangelicalism today. Well, that's why they believe in the pre-trib rapture. And if you don't, hey, you're my brother or sister in Christ, and I love you, and I hope the best for you. And I don't think that you're an idiot for believing it, and um, hopefully you don't think that way of me for, for believing it or that I'm, I'm a false teacher and leading people astray because I teach the pre-trib rapture. All right, thank you, Golden Truth, for that. Um, maybe you got a little bit more than you expected, um, but I do feel strongly that we've got to walk in love towards one another. And if we are wrong, let's just say everybody that believes in the pre-trib rapture, which is a lot, okay, are wrong, then how are you going to persuade us to know the truth? You got to do it with love and gentleness because the servant of the Lord should not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, correcting those that are in opposition. So my encouragement to you as someone who's pre-trib, who wants to convince somebody, then do it through love. Do it in a kind way instead of being angry and, um, and insulting and accusatory where they don't apply. And if you're going to accuse you're going to accuse me of that, then you're accusing Charles Swindoll of that. You're accusing David Jeremiah of that. You're accusing, I, I stand in good company then. If the things that I'm being called a heretic for are good, solid Bible teachers, like John MacArthur and others, then I'll, I'll take it I, from you. It's not true, but I'll take it because I'm standing in really good company. All right. So thank you very much, Golden Truth. I really appreciate your question. If you have a question today, all you got to do is write question down and then write your question out. Reread it a couple times. Make sure that it makes sense as we make our way through um, the questions. Uh, you're welcome, Joe. I, I hope that I finally got that answered for you. Um, I, I appreciate you continuing to ask that question. So um, I'm going to bring in a question here from Jari. Jari, uh, Jari, good to see you. And it dawned on me, this might be Jerry. I, I don't know. Is it Jerry or Jari? Why don't you let us know? Um, Jari, I'll call you Jari until then. Why doesn't God tell us our entire future on the day and the hour of his return? What if we knew? Um, I don't know what if we knew. I can pretty much tell you I don't want to know my future. And I think that that would be a dangerous thing for any of us to know. I don't think that God's going to reveal that to us. Um, and the day and the hour of his return? Well, I can tell you why he doesn't want that. He's told us. Because he wants us to live our lives ready. He, if, if we knew what time he would come, then we would go, well, he's not coming back for five years. I can go ahead and get ready. I'll have time to get ready. If we knew when we were going to die, we could get ourselves ready for our death. But death comes unexpectedly to some and Jesus is going to return unexpectedly. And that's why we've got to make sure that we have our life ready. We got to be ready, um, which means, you know, a few things about getting ready and staying ready. Um, the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Way too many Christians are delighting themselves in the things of the world. And their, their desires are the things of the world. In the sensuality or sexuality of the world. And they're desiring the sensuality or the sexuality because that's what they're, they're, they're feeding their flesh. And from their flesh, they're going to reap corruption. You got to get that out of your life. And you do that by sowing to the Spirit. The Bible says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh and abide in Christ and his word in you and you will ask what you desire because your desires will change if you delight in God. You can, um, you may, you may judge yourself compared to people around you and you may say, well, I don't walk that close to God. I can't walk as close as somebody I know, but all you got to do is walk closer tomorrow than you are today. It's, it's, it's baby step, Dr. Leo Marvin, baby steps. So you just take a step in the right direction and you keep on walking that way. The next thing you know, you are, you are standing solid with Jesus Christ. Turn from those things to keep short accounts with God. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord more tomorrow than you do today, and you will be ready. And when he returns, you'll be like, I was waiting for you. And not only will you be ready, but you will be right, and, and it will be an awesome thing. All right, Jari, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your question. Uh, we have, let's see, Jar, we're just taking one question per person today. Um, we'll come back and take, if we run out of questions by the end of the hour, we'll come back and we'll take some new, uh, some of the ones that people ask twice. But right now we're taking one question per person. Um, and we have one here from Melissa. Melissa says, um, once saved, always saved. Even if you are living in 
continued sin? Question mark. Once saved, always saved? Even if you're living in continued sin? Um, so once saved, always saved. Um, I've always said that it is a, a mute argument. It, it shouldn't even be argued. Because let's just take this person who's living in sin. Let's just say that they're, they've, they're, there's a severe sin. Let's say that as a Christian, they walk with God for years, but then they divorced their wife and they married someone else. Um, just for no reason. It's because they wanted to. They had an affair. Divorced their wife and married the person they were having an affair with. Um, Calvinists are going to say that the, the fact that he did that, the fact that he walked away from God, the fact that he treated his wife that way, the fact that he had this affair and married this other woman and was living in adultery, proves that he was never a Christian. The Arminianist is going to say, well, that person didn't walk, know God, but walked away from him and now is unsaved. So these guys both agree more than what they disagree on when, when it comes to that guy. They both say he's unsaved and needs to be saved. And that's why I think the argument is just a useless argument. You can argue about it if you want to, but the person that walks away and is living in unconfessed, unrepented sin. Now, even if you are living in continued sin, um, the Bible says those who practice such things are not going to enter the kingdom of God, but we also know that we do sin. And if anyone says they don't sin, they're a liar, right? First John chapter 1. So we want to make sure that we confess our sins to God, that we walk in that forgiveness, that we get our feet washed, as it were, when Peter washed, Jesus washed Peter's feet, and said, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me, probably because their fellowship was broken. So continued sin could lead to reveal that you never really had a commitment to Christ, or it could lead to you repenting and giving your life back to Christ. Only God knows um, and reveals how far that is. But if someone blatantly openly walks away from Christ and lives in a sinful lifestyle, then I can we can be pretty confident they're not saved. All right? Um, and once saved, always saved, I do lean towards when someone makes a real genuine commitment to Christ, they are transformed, they are born again, their spirit comes to life, and even if they do walk away, they're going to come back. So I believe that I, I, I lean towards once saved, always saved, which is a change for me, by the way. For many years in ministry, I, I didn't believe that. But the more I searched the scriptures, the more I really believe Jesus will leave the 99 and go after the one and that a genuinely saved individual will endure to the end. And the Bible says that, endure to the end and you will be saved. So if someone doesn't endure to the end, it's a revelation that they are not saved and perhaps were never saved. Could I be wrong about that, by the way, because there's enough scriptures that go either way that, that, that say things that you can construe to be either side? Yes, definitely. Okay? I could be wrong about it. But that's my understanding of it right now. Okay? So, um, yeah, you just got to look at the individual. And if they are living apart from God, at least you can say, if you continue this, then you're, you won't have a relationship with God. I've, I've heard people use once saved, always saved as a, a means to cover up their sin. Oh, it's okay. I went up forward. I, I gave my life to the Lord. It's okay that I'm living this way. Once saved, always saved. And um, eh, better, better be careful because if you really and genuinely are saved and you want to do what God's commanded you to do, you're not shrugging your shoulders at sin. Okay? Hopefully that will be helpful. Melissa, I appreciate your question. Thank you very much. Um, very good. Uh, so I'm going to bring in another question here. If you are just joining us, uh, it's good to have you. If you're new here on the podcast, really good to have you joining us. Uh, we take questions and look at them through the lens of scripture so we can determine what we believe. Um, and if you have a question, you can write the word question in front of it, write your question out, reread it a couple of times, make sure it's clear, and then go ahead and submit it. And uh, we'll go ahead and take your question. So we have a question from um, searching. So Genesis 32, 24 through 32, Jacob wrestles with a man, verse 24, who could not prevail, who he, he could not prevail against, uh, who could not prevail against Jacob, verse 25. If this man were an angel or God, why couldn't he prevail against Jacob? Thanks, searching. I appreciate that. Um, remember on things like this, I'm answering off the top of my head. It's been a long time since I've been in the book of, of Genesis teaching through it. 
So I'm just going to kind of give you what I think as I'm, I'm kind of looking at it and I'll let you know once I'm done how confident I am with it. Um, so God gave man free will. And we can choose to love him or we can choose to walk away from him. Jacob is the example of someone who choose to, chose to, to choose God. Esau is a, an example, his brother, of someone who was in the flesh who chose not to follow after spiritual things. But Jacob had a problem too. His problem was that he wanted to take what God had instead of waiting for God to give it. God was already going to give it. He had told Rebekah, there's two nations in your womb and the older will serve the younger. Jacob was already the one God had chosen. But Jacob demanded it anyway. I used to have a dog that when I would give it a treat, it would almost take my hand off. You had to get your hand out of the way. And I was like, I'm giving it to you. You don't have to bite my hand off. I'm giving it to you. And that's what God was doing with Jacob. So God wrestled with him because Jacob had been wrestling with God his whole life. Jacob had free will and Jacob wouldn't give up. His free will was to hang on. Now God could have overpowered him, but God doesn't overpower any of us. So God wrestled with him. And Jacob had been wrestling with God his whole life. It's a sign of it. And, and some of us are wrestling with God right now. Instead of just receiving what God has for us and following him and finding rest in him, we're wrestling with him. And that's the point. I'm afraid whenever I study the life of Jacob that I'm like Jacob. I want what God wants. I want spiritual things. I'm afraid I have a hard time just sitting back and allowing God to bring it in. So it's because of God, uh, because of the free will that God gave to Jacob that God didn't just overcome him. And so Jacob says, I'm not gonna let you go till you bless me. And that's kind of a revelation to this whole thing, right? I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. And so God touches his hip and it goes out of socket. And he walks with a cane or, or a crutch the rest of his life. And that's the blessing. He took away some of his strength to be able to wrestle with God. And he had to sit back now and trust in God. It's a blessing to have less personal strength and more trust in God. Now, I would think it would be even more of a blessing if you can say, my strength isn't enough, my ambition is, is wrong, it's self-seeking, and I'm just gonna trust in God to bring what God wants to in my life. And God will bless you, he's, he's promised that. That your life will be blessed. You Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, right? But his delights in the law of the Lord. So. I'm, I'm pretty confident that that's the answer to why God wrestled with him and how God could have put him under really quickly. But we know it was God because later on he says, I've wrestled with God. And he had wrestled with God his entire lifetime. Probably the angel of the Lord who is God. Um, it's the angel of the Lord that appears to Moses in the burning bush and says, I am, or Yahweh, Yehovah, I am who I am. Um, I, I am has, tell my I am has sent you. In the name of God is I am, or Ye Jehovah or YHWH, the Tetragrammaton. All right, so thank you very much, Searching. I hope that that was helpful. Uh, we are gonna go ahead and look for another question here. I appreciate that, by the way. We have, um, uh, we have a question from, is it Ishmael? Ishmael? Ishmael says, question, what is the best most loving and truthful way to approach a family member that comes out as gay. Uh, so, wow, I'm trying to, I, I wanna really be helpful to you, Ishmael. Um, I think, first of all, that knowing that this is a difficult situation that you are probably not going to go and show them what the Bible says about homosexuality being an abomination and get them to go, oh, okay, I'll stop doing this. So whatever you do has to be accompanied with prayer and fasting. I think that this is one of the ways, ways in which you would, one of the reasons which you would fast, that you know someone that has come out as being gay such deception happening in the world today, such deception in our schools that are introducing children at a very young age to these thoughts, which anyone 
anyone could go down that road. I realize there are some who say that they would never do it, not me. I, I, I'm not gay, I wouldn't go down that road. Anyone can. Just get more and more perverse and you'll go down that road eventually. And anyone can. And um, so I, I, I say fast and pray and I don't know that I have any words for you to be able to go and share with them. I would say to love them, you already said it lovingly in a truthful way, I would love them and I would be honest with them if, um, if, if, if I had a son or a daughter that were gay, I would, I would let them know I still love them. I would have a relationship with them. I would call them. I would talk to them. I would also, when the topic was broached, be honest. And that might make things really uncomfortable. But the truth has to be said. And they can come out of this lifestyle, come out away from it. Um, we're living in those, I think we're living in the last days. And I think the acceptance of of homosexuality and all of these different things that are out there now that people are being encouraged along and encouraged in at very, very young ages. is such a tragedy. I think God's got to come back soon. I really do uh, because of that. So I don't know how helpful I was, Ishmael. Um, it's just one of those hard things, but I would love them, be there for them. Let them know that you're not ostracizing them. I realize it's hard to spend time around them. They're probably having a hard time spending around, time around you as well. But stand up for the truth. Do it in love. Do it with kindness. Do it with gentleness. And perhaps God will grant them repentance. All right? So thank you very much for asking that question. Hopefully it's helpful. My heart goes out to you and anyone else that's dealing with the situation, which seems to be more and more these days. All right? So thank you again. And uh, we have a question here from Lisa from Facebook. Lisa says, is God okay with tattoos? Yes. All right, let's go ahead and look for our next question. Um, yeah, um, in the Old Testament times, people had got tattoos and sometimes they do today as well, according to their religion, right? So whatever God they serve, they tattooed and, and the priests of, of, of Baals were known for tattooing themselves. And so God had say, said to stay away from those tattoos um, in the Old Testament. So some people carry that over to the New Testament when we don't have the same issues, we don't have the same culture. And God is going to, we're going to have a tattoo, something written on us. God's going to have, I think it says in Revelation that God's going to have a tattoo, um, something written on him. So tattoos are okay. I would just be careful what you put on. Make sure it's honoring to God. That's all. You want to honor God in everything that you do. And so, go ahead and get that tattoo. My late wife had Jude 21 tattooed right here. And so that where she's getting her hair cut or her nails done or whatever, people would say, what's that? And she would say, it's keep yourself in the love of God. And she would quote that verse to them. And it was a way for her to witness. And um, what a good tool it was to be able to share Christ. When um, anyone would ask her, she had that tattoo to be able to do it. Um, the thing was that she wanted more tattoos. Once she got one tattoo, it's almost like addicting. She wanted more and she wanted more and she wanted more. All right. So, um, yes, tattoos are okay. There's nothing in the New Testament times apart from the law and the culture they were living in before that would make tattoos bad. Whether or not it's, it's wise or good, I don't know. A lot of ugly tattoos, but, um, uh, and keep them. Yeah, never mind. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let it go there. All right. I was going to tell you where to keep them off of, but, um, you know, um, I, I would suggest you're going to get tattoos, get them somewhere where they, you can cover them up with a shirt, with a collar, with sleeves, if you need to. All right. And I realize we live in a, a whole different culture now. I, I had this argument with my son who loves tattoos, my middle son. Um, and, uh, we had that argument, you know, about, and, and he, he was a paramedic and, had his tattoos. Of course, he covered them up all the time. I'm not saying that they wouldn't have had he not covered it up because I do know paramedics and firefighters who have a lot of tattoos. All right. So thank you very much. And again, Jari, we're just taking one question by each person. If we get to the end of the hour and we run out of questions, we'll come back up and we'll pick up some of these other questions. All right. So Renee has a question and Renee says, question, how can a person discern 
the sheep in wolf's clothing. I have been taken in by a few. As a result, do not trust anyone. All right, Renee, um, I'm sorry to hear that. And I'm not sure not trusting anyone is a good thing. There are good, solid pastors that have given time, put time in to be able to show that they are faithful to the word of God that you can trust. There are also false teachings that are out there. And Jesus said, beware and let no one deceive you. So you have the responsibility, Renee, to make sure that you are not deceived. And here's what happened. You're open to someone you shouldn't trust. They deceive you with a false doctrine. So then you shut yourself off from people that you should trust. There's a lot of good, solid Bible teachers that have put in the time, that, that, that have defended the truth that you can learn from. So I would narrow that, that, that search down Stay away from people that maybe are um, sensational. Stay away from people who are mean and come up with something new, um, who tear down other pastors. Uh, that This is ungodly and unbiblical. Um, just follow people that are teaching the scriptures and the truth. And I believe that you'll be able to find people who, who believe it. Also, Renee, for yourself, Learn how to discern the word of God for yourself. Learn how to rightly divide God's word. To, to study it with the proper hermen, hermen, uh, hermeneutics, okay? And um, being able to um, give an answer for the faith that is within you. So really study God's word for yourself. So receive the word of God with all joy, but study the scriptures to see whether or not these things are true. We live in a time where whatever we're exposed to, whatever teaching we're exposed to, all it takes is a little bit of a search to find out if there are questions about it. Then you've got to determine, is this legitimate or not, right? Because a lot of times good teachers will be called false teachers. They'll, they'll make a video on them being a false teacher, but false teachers often have a lot of videos telling that they are false teachers and why, and you can, you can take that information in and you can receive it. Um, but you've been given the word of God. You've been given the Holy Spirit and learn to be a good discerner if something is of the flesh or something is of the spirit. And I think that you'll be able to find that out. And, um, you really should trust. You should receive the word of God with all joy, but search the scriptures to find out whether these things are so. And then to stand your ground, you'll gain more knowledge and information and, um, you will not be, um, taken advantage of if you are indeed studying God's word properly. We could talk about the proper ways to study God's word. Um, you want to take it literally if you can. Obviously, there are some metaphors, but you want to take it as literally as you possibly can. That will protect you. Uh, you want to compare scripture to scripture. No scripture stands by itself. Sometimes there's a snapshot and it looks one way because the whole snapshot, it just back away. But then when you dive in and you find that certain events are broken up within this snapshot and you can get the right perspective and what the word, what, what really is being written about by comparing scripture and scripture, no scripture stands alone. You've got to take it in context. If someone is teaching you that you can be rich to be godly is rich, then get away from them. The Bible says the first Timothy chapter six, if someone is teaching you, um, that you can be involved, uh, sexually in this world with, with affairs or adultery, fornication, then God says, I'll deal with such a person. First Thessalonians chapter three, first part of the chapter there, I'll deal with that person. And if you are resisting that we, we need to give God holiness and purity in the sexual area, then you're not fighting against God, you're fighting against men. So we could kind of go down through the list of them and see, obviously, if someone is saying, look, fornication is okay, they're defrauding people in order to be involved sexually with them. If they say, God wants me to be rich, then we can go, well, okay, but every Christian, and you could start, and when they're teaching you that if you give to them, you can be rich and so on. You can really see where these false teachings are. They are they become evident uh, when we, we look at them clearly and see it clearly. So find yourself good Bible teachers you can trust. And there are a lot of them. And then study God's word according uh, to that, okay? 
So thank you very much, Renee. I really appreciate that. Uh, we have another question. Um, and, and, and Renee, also your question was, how can I discern a, sh a sheep, a wolf's clothing and sheep? Um, you're going to know them by their fruits. Eventually, it's going to become evident that they're a, in, a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. As, as, you're, as you're listening to them, you're going to be able to identify by the fruit of their lives. And so the Bible tells us shepherds that we're to conduct ourselves in such a way that people can see the outcome of our lives, that they would know that they can trust us because of the outcome of our lives. All right. Thank you, Renee. I really appreciate that. Uh, I hope you have great success in finding a, a handful of Bible teachers that you can really trust and you can really believe in, that you can learn from. All right. So we're going to bring in a question here from John. John says, question, whether we die or alive and raptured, would we be able to continue praying for others? I know we can praise God and sing, but I would love to continue praying for those who are left on earth. That's an interesting question, John, one that I had never thought of. Um, so we are, we're raptured, we're with Christ, um, we've got the judgment, the the um, Bema Seat Judgment, where our motives are tested as individuals. We've got the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Um, we know there are loved ones that are going through literal hell on earth during the tribulation period. I would think that we could still continue to ask God. I have no scripture for it. I don't, I don't find anything that would tell me that I could. It is, I don't know that this concept of being able to pray for people after we're raptured or after we die um, would be unbiblical. It would be non-biblical in the sense that we don't find anything like that in the Bible. Seems like there's a disconnect when we die from the things of this world, but who, who's to tell, right? Who, who's to really know whether or not we have an opportunity to be able to do that? Just because something isn't in the Bible doesn't mean it's not true. We do know there are things that our Bible is against and we can stand strongly against those. So interesting question, John. Um, what I would do now though is pray. Redeem the time, Paul said. We're, we're, the time is short. Redeem it. So pray now for them. Lay a good foundation of prayer. Just in case we can't pray, it's that, that time is done, that intercession session time is done when we die or when we're raptured, then pray for them now. Lay a foundation of prayers because prayer is like incense that fills up the throne room of God. I think our prayers remain there and God works through our prayers that we can pray today. So that would be my encouragement, John. All right, so thank you very much. I appreciate you and I appreciate your question and good to see you. So we have a question from Ethan, um, which says, Ethan, uh, question, Acts 16, 31, King James Version. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved with thy household. What is the exact meaning of this scripture? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and thy household. Um, what it's not saying, Ethan, is that if you are saved, your whole household is going to be saved. I do know that there is a kind of covenant theology teaching out there that if you get saved, then your whole family will be saved. But as far as I can tell, this is not biblical. The family would have to do the believe as well. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your whole household. So everybody has to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. To believe on in him is to believe, to trust on, to rely upon, to invite him into your life, to receive him, to repent, to turn from your sins. You're believing what he says about being the only way, the truth, and the life. You're believing what the word of God says when it says that no fornicators, no adulterers, no liars are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Those that practice such things will not enter in. So you've got to get those practices out of your life. You're believing those. And the household has to believe it as well. This is also the passage where it says, um, believe and be baptized and you will be saved, I think is the same in the same section. Um, when the Bible says, believe and be baptized and you will be saved, 
But when, a, when you believe you're supposed to be baptized, the Bible does say in other places, believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved, like here. But I think the question here that you have, Ethan, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is whether or not family members are saved when we're saved. And the answer to that is no. There's no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. Each person has to receive Jesus for themselves. That doesn't mean that there's not a day of accountability. It doesn't mean that there's not an umbrella that covers our kids before they are old enough to make the decision for themselves. But when they're old enough to make that decision, they have to make that for themselves. Okay? So I I believe that that's what that passage is saying. Thank you very much, Ethan. I appreciate that. Nice to have you here with us. If you are new here, then thank you for joining us. It's our prayer that God would bless you by the time that we discuss just different questions that people have. Um, we have, um, let's see, we have a question from Matthew Vick. Matthew, good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, was Judas uh, saved? Then he turned his back on the Lord. Um, so I'm just trying to get, kind of get my mind around the whole Judas thing again. No, I don't believe that Judas was ever saved. He was a thief, the Bible tells us, that he kept the money purse, which is interesting because Jesus would have known he was a thief and gave him the money purse. It's almost like Jesus puts it there to reveal what really is in his heart. If he was really serving God and wanting to serve him, he wouldn't have stole from the money purse. But because his heart was in money, he just stole. And then he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Even though he lamented later on, he could have repented I don't think the sin of selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, Judas could have come, like Peter who denied Jesus and came back, Judas could have come back, but he didn't. Instead, he took his own life. And so, um, no, Judas was the son of perdition. He had the, the greatest of all opportunities to be a disciple of Christ, but he was the son of perdition because he let it go to waste. And, and, and is not a true, was not a true believer. That, that is my opinion. And I don't think there's anything in the scriptures that I can think of that would ever make us think that Judas was um, ever really saved. Interesting enough, it's been pointed out that Judas was from the city, probably was more educated than the rest of them from a human perspective, probably had a better, you know, better credentials to be an apostle, but wasn't. And I think that Paul became his replacement. Thank you, Michael, for joining us, or Matthew, for joining us. I really appreciate that. I hope you're doing well, and it's good to see you. All right, so we're going to find another question here to bring in. We have a question from Annika, and Annika says, question, what are some lessons we can learn from the recent sexual misconduct by pastors, um, apologists like Ben Corson. Um, so, Annika, there are a lot of a lot of guys that have had problems as of late. Um, I don't know all the details with Ben. Um, Ben's a friend, and my heart breaks for what he's going through. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm because of because of how close I am to Ben. I'm just going to go ahead and um, pass on on him. Um, I think it's it's hard when this happens because you do get lumped in. And I don't know. Maybe maybe Ben should be lumped into him or not. I don't know. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to defend him. I'm just saying I know him, and it's tra- it's a real tragedy to me. Because I like him, you know, and if I even if I didn't like him, I love him. He's a brother in Christ. And um, what are the lessons we can learn from sexual misconduct by pastors and apologists? Um, be genuine. Be real. Uh, turn away from these things because what's done in secret will be shouted from the rooftop. Success in ministry does not equate success in life, and oftentimes you find that pastors get confused about that. They think things are going really well. This is nothing new, Annika. Um, you had the Jim Baker scandals, the, the um, uh, all, all the different scandals that you had in the 80s 
with the television evangelists. Um, you've got what's going on right now with Brian Houston. Um, you've got Robbie Zacharias. You've got um, the other Hillsong pastor. Um, his name is slipping me now. Um, you guys are all yelling it at me um, in, uh, in New York. And they're all just so absolutely tragic and are just such a warning to us pastors that we have to keep things right with God. And there's none of us that are above having what's what what you might be doing put out into the open. All right. So thank you, Annika, for your question. It really is too bad that these things have to come up. Um, and like I said, I'm not sure of all of the details with with Ben. Um, but my heart breaks over it. All right. Thanks, Annika. I appreciate that. I appreciate your question. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get another question here. And um, it's good to have you guys here. Um, if you have a question, then you can write the word question down and then go ahead and follow it. Make sure you reread it to make sure that it makes sense. Uh, we have a question from Adam P. And um, Adam P. says, question, uh, when you're in a Bible study, do you read scripture from different Bibles? L example, King James, New King James, NIV. Which Bible do you see is the best for study? Thank you very much, Adam. I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think that there are different Bibles for different applications. Um, I use the New King James Bible. I've used it forever. Um, not because I necessarily think it's the absolute best for Bible study. The NASB may be better. The ESV is a good study Bible. Um, but I do want something like the New King James, which gives a word for word translation. They're trying to make it make sense and they have to add in words to get it to what the Greek is, because sometimes the Greek is laid out differently or the Hebrew is laid out differently. But you can go and see the corresponding word in the original manuscripts, or at least what manuscripts have been brought together and chosen for that particular translation. I think there's great value when you use Blue Letter Bible or, or some other tool that you can look at all of the different uh, translations in one place. And you can see where they agree and where they disagree, and you can learn a lot from that. So um, when I'm studying the Bible, yes, I will definitely, I, I'll, I'll use the Strong's Concordance, I'll look up the words, I'll look at what different uh, translations say about whatever, whatever it is that I'm covering. Uh, yeah, so I will use different translations and um, I think there are good translations, there are poor translations. There are better translations, there are worse translations. If someone just comes to Christ, the New Living Bible is a great Bible to give them so they can start reading and get familiar with things. There will come a time to dive in. This is a paraphrased Bible. So someone has kind of gotten what they think it says and write, wrote it out. It's not good for study, but it is good to get familiar with the Bible. Just get familiar with it and then dive in and to really study the things that are there. It can be very, very helpful. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate that. Uh, good, good question. And it is good to see you. All right, um, it's kind of going through here. Remember, we are only taking one question per person. Uh, so as we get down here to the end of the hour, and we're almost done, we got like four minutes that are left. I'm looking for new questions. If I don't get one, I'll come back up and I'll pick up some of these other questions that we have here, uh, people asking more than one question. But um, I would say, just go ahead and when you write your question, uh, write your question and write it out so that it makes sense and then go ahead and submit it. We have a question here from Terry. Terry says, I have a friend in the Seventh-day Adventists uh, and he says, I will never go to heaven because I don't go to church on the real Sabbath. Okay, Terry, don't worry about them. All right. Um, that, that is a, that's a false gospel. We are saved by grace through faith, not of any works lest anyone should boast. And Romans 14 says one day at one man esteems one day above another, another man esteems all days alike. They do it unto the Lord. If they don't observe it, they don't observe it to the Lord. If they observe it, they observe it to the Lord. Seven day Adventists are like the Pharisees. They teach the traditions of men as if they were the commandments of God. 
Okay, did you get that? The Seventh-day Adventists are often like the Pharisees. They teach the traditions of men as if they were the Word of God. And then when you break their traditions, they claim you're not going to heaven. Jesus never broke the, the uh, Sabbath, but they claimed he did because he broke their commandments, their traditions of men. Then they claimed he broke it. So they do the same thing to you. They say going to church uh, on Saturday is the Sabbath. That's keeping the Sabbath. Where does it say that in the Bible? Where does it say going to, to church on the Sabbath? Show me. Where does it say that? Does it say it? They rewrite the Sabbath day to mean something different than what it originally meant. And then they say that you are going to hell because of it. That you can't go to heaven because of it. It's unfortunate. And if you are a Sabbatarian and you're listening to this, stop it. Turn from it. Um, we have a um, we have videos on this on our on our YouTube page, full length videos, which I go into every detail. We go back to the the first place it was ever mentioned. We look at the promises of God to the nation of Israel. We see how it's applied in the New Testament, and we see that Jesus is my Sabbath. I tell people who are Sabbatarians who tell me that I'm taking the mark of the beast because I'm not going to church on Sunday. I mean, because I go to church on Sunday, that Jesus is my Sabbath. He became the high priest, he became the sacrifice, and he became the Sabbath. And so I'm a Sabbatarian. And I would not worry about them, not one iota. I instead follow Christ. Um, the reason that we go to church on Sunday is because we saw the early church meeting together in the book of Acts on Sunday. And it became a tradition. Is there a scripture that says it? No. So I don't make it a command. I don't want to take the traditions of men and turn them into the commands of um, and try to and, and teach them as if they were the commands of God because they're not. So don't let them rewrite scripture and then lay a trip on you, okay? They're trying to lay a heavy trip on you. Just slough it off and continue to walk with Christ. And as you interact with them, you can tell them, I disagree. It's receiving Jesus as your savior. It's inviting him in and having your life transformed and having your spirit born again that causes you to go into heaven, okay? So thank you very much for your guys' questions. Terry, we welcome. If you're here, new here for the very first time, we're really glad you're here. We hope that you are blessed. I see there's a few more questions that are on here. Um, I'll take a look at them. I'll, I'll get the log. Daniel will send me the log of this. I'll take a look at those questions so I can look at them in the future for uh, the beginning of future Q&As. All right. So God bless you guys. Thank you again very much for uh, being here with us, for submitting your questions. I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you, uh, that God watch over you. We have a service in two hours, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to be talking about that Jesus comes like a thief in the night. Like a thief in the night. He doesn't come to steal something from you, but he's going to show up like a thief in the night at an hour you don't expect. He's not going to tell you when he's going to be there. He's going to wait until you don't expect it. And Jesus is coming back at a time that we don't expect and we're going to be talking about that tonight. We'd love to have you guys join us at 6 o'clock. Go to either YouTube or Facebook or calvarytucson.com. And uh, you'll be able to join us live on any of those forms. All right. So God bless you guys. It's good to see you. As always, good to hang out with you. We'll have our next Q&A, Lord willing, on Wednesday. I'm going to go ahead and sign out. So God bless you guys. We'll see you later on.